Hello everyone, this is Jonas Inger. I'm the CEO of uh, OSTE. And I'm here online with um, Dr. Raquel Sita from uh, Portugal. And we're going to do um, a short uh, interview and discussion about her uh, experience clinically uh, from using Ostel Diagnostics. So, uh, Raquel, I'm, I'm really happy to have you with me here uh, remotely. So I hope you're, you're well and uh, safe in, in uh, Portugal. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, could you please introduce yourself and tell us a bit about your, uh, your background um, uh, clinically? Um, so to introduce myself, that's a difficult question, <laughs> yep. but I will try my best. So basically I'm a wife, I'm a mom of a eight year old uh, girl, Carolina. Um, and I'm very passionate about dentistry. I'm practicing for the last 18 years. And uh, I did uh, my education basically in Portugal. I'm a dental medical doctor in, in Portugal. Uh, I did it, I finished in 2002. Uh, and then I did my master's degree also uh, and my PhD in Portugal. In between, I went to Sweden. Uh, curiously, to Gothenburg, uh, mm -hmm. to the Brandmark Institute, and to the Vasterhaus um, Maxillofacial Award Hospital. Um, and I did some post graduation also in implantology. It was my first contact with Ostel, to be honest. It was 18 years ago, mm -hmm. that was the big one. Uh, <laughs> and then um, also, uh, I'm a certified oral surgeon in Portugal since 2017, that opened uh, the uh, the name is Oral Surgeon uh, in Portugal uh, Association. And I'm also teaching at the university and doing a lot of lectures worldwide. And uh, I like a lot to travel, but at this moment we are a little <laughs> bit. Uh, but in the last uh, few years, I traveled and lectured in more than 25 countries. Uh, but now it's a little bit different, so we have to adapt and do it online. But basically, I'm a very passionate person about my profession, about my family. Um, I try to balance the two, not, not always uh, yeah. easy, but uh, I'm, I'm trying my best. And uh, I'm also a, um, a woman in a man's world because I'm an oral surgeon and there's not uh, so many uh, women, at least in, um, in the stages and uh, teaching in the university and in shifts position. So I'm trying also to motivate the next generation to, to rise to the stage, to have more women on stage. Yeah. So basically, I think that's it. <laughs> yeah, that's a long, long uh, uh, background. And um, <clears throat> of course, it's not possible to summarize everything here in a, yeah. in a short conversation. Uh, you've also published quite a bit. Um, I'm uh, sure yeah. we'll get into that uh, a bit later. Um, but if if we start uh, with with uh, the uh, Ostel side of, of things, uh, okay. could you uh, describe shortly how how you use Ostel today in in your uh, clinic? Okay, so the first contact I have with Ostel it was about. 18 years ago, when I went to Sweden, they mm -hmm. were using in the Maxillofacial Ward Hospital when I did my post graduation. And for me, that was very new because I never heard about it. And then for many years, I, I saw it in some conferences, but it was not something that it was very used, at least in a daily practice. But then uh, when I started my PhD, uh, I had an idea of doing a study uh, that uh, used the ISQ to do the follow-up of the of the cases to do to measure the, the primary stability and the evolution till secondary stability in three different groups of bone regeneration in the posterior maxilla, and then I started using as a research tool, and then I realized that really it was something that I should use every day in my clinic. So I started eight years ago when I started my PhD using uh, and now I can't uh, work without it, to be honest. It's something that is really, really uh, a way to do predictable uh, uh, guidelines, protocols, to do decisions in a um, scientific background because it's not only 
about my experience with Austel is the experience of decades, you know, of uh, research, of more than 1,000 articles published, mm -hmm. and I also published some uh, related to, the, to this topic. And really, it's something that I started to use eight years ago, and now I can't, uh, you know, work without it. It's something that is very, very use useful for my daily practice to, to take decisions, like basic decisions, to mm -hmm. what type of load I'm going to do, uh, how long I'm going to, to, to wait to do the loading. Uh, is this going uh, good in terms of uh, healing? Is this going bad? It's, it's the only tool, the, the only objective tool I have to measure the stability because the other ones are very subjective. Okay, the torque, we can measure at the time of placement, but we can't measure anymore. Or, or only if you are doing research, okay, we do, do the counter torque, but not on humans, we do it in animals or in, in research protocols. So it's something that really it's, uh, I think it was a breakthrough uh, to dentistry. And uh, for someone that does implantology, not only surgical, but the rehabilitation, it's something that is essential to have in the office. Yeah, uh, I'm really happy to hear you um, um, saying that and, and the benefits you see um, for, from uh, Ostel. And, and getting those Ostel readings or Ostel ISQ values, what, could you describe what that gives you? And, and uh, uh, we'll talk a bit more in, in, uh, in, uh, shortly about uh, the surgical and loading protocols. But what, what, what value do you perceive getting from ISQ readings when, during your surgery and your procedures? Okay. I'm not <clears throat> only using the ISQ, I'm using several um, factors to, to have my decisions, of course. Mm -hmm. So basically, my main factors that I consider is the uh, insertion torque that measures the rotation of teeth stability, the ISQ that measures the actual stability, and I do the follow-up of the healing with the ISQ because the torque I can't use, and then also I I also take the decisions not only about these two objective measures, but also about the bone uh, quality and the patient uh, that I have, because some patients are more risk, have more risks than others and have more medical problems than others. And also about the complexity of the case. If I have a very complex case, even if I have the optimal guidelines, sometimes I don't go uh, too far in terms of immediate loading or because I need to protect my patient and protect myself. Mm. For instance, we are talking about like uh, severe atrophic cases that the risk of doing immediate loading can induce the fracture. Of course, I should put the healing abutments and wait a little bit because the patient is, I don't know, 82 or 85. Mm -hmm. So for her, one or two months more is not a difference. And for me, the risk is less. So we have to, to be more than um, machines, because medicine is not mathematics, mm -hmm. uh, we need to be doctors and see the patient that, uh, if it was uh, our fam family, our father, our, our mother, and um, also adjust the protocols to our clinical sense. Uh, because I 99% of the cases, I use the guidelines. In 1% of the cases, my clinical sense overlaps the guidelines because I think there are other considerations that you, you should have, uh, not only the, the objective measures like the torque and the ISQ, but in 99% of the cases, the guidelines are that, and the, I, I, I use that guidelines to choose between doing, uh, putting a, a cover screw, putting a healing abutment, doing an immediate loading, how long should I wait? Should I wait uh, uh, one month and a half? Should I wait three or four months? Because there are several um, factors that influence that. But 99% of the cases, these guidelines are very, very easy to, to, to use mm -hmm. and very easy to follow. And basically, they are the same for all the system of implants. We can have like a slightly difference uh, because of the macro design or the surface, but we are talking about one or two points. It's not relevant in terms of clinical decisions. It can be re relevant in terms of uh, research, but it's not relevant in terms of uh, um, mm -hmm. clinical decisions. So uh, the guidelines I use, uh, 
I use with any system or endpoints. It, it doesn't depend on, on the type of endpoint that I'm using because it's basically a threshold that you should uh, uh, have between uh, going for uh, uh, two-stage surgery, one-stage surgery, or immediate loading. And we have like these three uh, uh, steps, three uh, uh, yep. degrees of uh, of uh, complexity and uh, of uh, of course of primary stability that is bigger uh, to have these uh, conditions to do the immediate loading in a predictable way. Yep. Thank you. And and you uh, almost already answered um, uh, my question on on what surgical protocols you're using. Do, is there yeah, uh, like a yeah. default uh, protocol that you plan for, but then uh, you you observe the the clinical indications you get uh, and and um, yes. you know, uh, yes. values, Maybe and then you decide. I can share here uh, what I use, like basically in my daily basis. Let me try to share my screen. Let me yes. see if I can manage. Okay, so let me see here. Okay, um, like this one. Maybe it's easier yes. uh, for people to understand that this is a, like a, a very basic scale and a very basic uh, and very user friendly to use because well, of course, this is only regarding the ISQ, the stability. But of course, we also have to think about the torque together. But first, let's talk about one thing, and then we will update the data together. So basically, when we are talking about the ISQ, this is like a traffic light. And I think the idea of the new Ostel beacon uh, to have the, the colors, it's perfect. Because the colors are matching with the traffic light, and with the, the, the different levels of, of stability. So this is very easy to explain. So basically, if you have a low stability that is in the red zone, it means that regarding immediate loading, you can't do it. And is the most uh, uh, um, basic uh, situation, and you have to put a cover screw. So we have to have a, a two-stage protocol. We have to wait and then put the healing button after the healing. If you have a medium stability, and the medium stability is considered the, the yellow, okay, let's basically say between 60 and 70. There's some slightly different if you are talking about single or multiple implants, but I'm going to define that uh, in, in the next exposition. So between 60 and, and 70, we have the yellow light. And the yellow light means maybe I can do it or maybe I shouldn't do it. And the yellow means basically you should put a healing abutment. And only in very specific situations you can do the immediate loading if you have near the upper threshold. And then the green light. The green light means, okay, you have the conditions to do immediate loading. Should I do it all the time? Not always, because sometimes we have to consider other factors, like the economic part of the patient. Sometimes the patient can't afford to, to buy a, a fixed provisional and has already a, um, a removable prosthesis and we can adapt. So this is the guideline of what is the ideal situation, but then we have to adapt uh, to the conditions of the country, of the patient, of economics, of several things. So basically the, the traffic light when it's green, okay, I can do uh, uh, immediate loading with no problem. Okay, this is basically uh, in, in general terms. Of course, uh, it's different when you consider uh, single implants or multiple implants, because in single, uh, you have the, the value has to be higher because you have more forces, uh, different forces uh, outside the center of the implant that are working. And when the, they are splinted together, they, they have the force together, so they can be a little bit, the, the values can be a slightly uh, lower. Uh, as you can see here, like this is my general protocols for almost every situation, independently of the brand of implants that we are using. This to be completely safe. If you ask me, uh, sometimes I risk a little, Yes, but I, I have 18 years of experience. For someone that is starting, they should follow the guidelines strictly. 
to have good results and predictable results. So for single, ideally, if you have torque lower than 30 and ISQ lower than 60 to two together, we are considering the two values together or one of uh, the values is lower than this, ideally, you should put a cover screw. So we do two surgical stage procedure. If you have torque more than uh, 30 and less than 45, and the ISQ between 60 and 70, we are in the maybe zone, the yellow zone. So one surgical stage for sure, in very specific situations, if you are experienced, you can go for immediate, but if you have the thresholds on the upper level. Uh, and the case that we have torque more than 45 and ISQ more than 72, this in single, uh, rehabilitation, we can perform it immediate loading with absolutely no problem. If it will fail, it's not because of this, it's because of other things, mm -hmm. because this is more than proved to be like this. Of course, if we go to multiple, because we are uh, um, splinting, we are working together, the forces are being shared, uh, like we, we see in the ballerinas, uh, the thresholds go a little bit down. So between, uh, instead of 30, we can consider the, 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 the limit, the inferior limit threshold 25, and uh, then the, the superior limit 40 instead of 45. So 25 instead of 30 and 40 instead of 45. And the only difference regarding the ISQ is uh, instead of 72, we can go downgrade a little bit to 70 because what we are talking. Mm -hmm. So basically, this is like very, very easy to use. If you have this kind of, it's only to have, you can put it on uh, your office, you know, a table with these numbers. And yes. if you, you, if you, go with this guidelines, there's no way uh, it will fade because of this, okay? It can fade by other things, but not because of this, because this is so well studied uh, that uh, it really, really uh, is, is a great uh, tool uh, to use to do something that um, will give you uh, predictability mm -hmm. uh, to long term. So basically, this is my guidelines that I use every day. So I will stop sharing. At least I think it's more easy to understand uh, the philosophy when you see the numbers than just talking about the numbers. Yeah. Yeah, Thanks. but my goals, if you ask me what would be my ideal goal uh, in terms of uh, stability, it depends on the case, okay? Because many times I have referee cases that are like very, very difficult and very, very in the limit. And maybe if I have a 65, after healing, I'll be happy. And uh, even a uh, 55 uh, in the implant placement, I'll be happy. But if I have a good uh, quality and quantity of bone, uh, ideally, I, I, I search for values that give me more credit. And uh, normally, I search ideally for a medium between 7 and 72, uh, not only in the implant placement, but also when I, I start the rehabilitation part, because I'm an oral surgeon, but I also do my rehabilitation. So I'm not deciding only the protocol, the surgical protocols, but also the prosthetic protocols uh, with these guidelines. Because when I go for second stage surgery or, or when I wait at least one, one month and a half, two months to do uh, uh, the measure of the ISQ after healing or three or four, if it's a big regeneration, uh, that value will give me the guidelines if I should go for the rehabilitation or not? Or should I wait? Or should I downgrade from healing to cover screw? Because this is not only a tool for follow-up, it's a tool that can warn you. If you have a very high ISQ when you do the implant placement, and then you measure after, after one month and a half, and the value was initially 80, and then we have 60, something is not okay. Mm -hmm. So we have something objective to show us that probably there is a problem there. And then we have to think what could be the problem. And sometimes I go a little bit back. So if I have a healing abutment, sometimes I put a cover screw, I close and I wait. And normally after one month, one month and a half, two months, it depends on the drop. I'll reopen 
I measured again, and 99% of the cases, the value is the same as it was in the beginning. So probably that implant was in overload, even with the healing, mm -hmm. or some tra traumatic force of the tongue or... I don't know, some para functional habits of the patient, you know, uh, uh, with the nails, with, uh, I don't know, pens, whatever. So sometimes there's uh, um, a way of us to predict that something is not uh, uh, okay and we can adapt our protocol because we have to be smart to adapt to the guidelines. That, because imagine if I don't have the ISQ, the implant is integrated, 60, okay. The implant is not moving. I can do impressions, whatever. But probably if I do impressions and I put uh, in one week the crown on top, uh, probably in a, a few weeks or a month, some months, I will have a, a big problem to solve. And maybe I have to remove the implant. Or I can do the other way around. I can measure. I can be um, aware that something is not good. I can prepare myself. I can go a little bit back wait and then re-enter again and 99 percent of the the situations i solve the problem like this just waiting because it's the only number that we can have after we have healing yep. even in some cases that i have for i i'm putting implants for 18 years because i started in the, in the year i graduated um i have cases that sometimes come uh, with some mucositis or perimplantitis. Mm -hmm. Also, the ISQ is a way for me to understand what is the status of that implant. Mm -hmm. And then if I do some procedure of regeneration of decontamination with laser, whatever procedure, if the implant is going in a good uh, way or in a bad way. Mm -hmm. Even uh, many times I use the ISQ together with other components, of course, uh, as a decision if I'll do explantation or if I try regeneration. So it's not only about the, the surgical protocols. It's not only about the prosthetic protocols. It's also about um, uh, dealing with the complications and having the, the difficult decision sometimes to explant or not explant. Mm -hmm. So I'm using... As, as I told you, the hostel in a, in a daily basis, it, it helps me in my daily decisions in something that is scientific, is not like my opinion. Because if I tell to a patient, okay, this implant has to be explanted. And yeah. he says, oh, but the other dentist said to me that he's going to try regeneration. And I can say, okay, but did the other dentist measure the ISQ and the stability? And I explained the patient about the actual stability and if the actual stability will be less than 50. The prognostic of that implant is very low. Mm -hmm. And the patient normally says, no, the, 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 the other doctor didn't say nothing. So why are you telling me this? And say, because scientifically, there's a background uh, that says that if you have a very low ISQ and the ISQ is going down, even down, that value, something is not... So why should I uh, waste time and money try to save this implant, if then you will lose the implant anyway. Not now, but in a few months. So this is also a way to communicate with the patient, not only between colleagues, that is also a very good way of communication mm -hmm. because I have a team, I don't work alone. And uh, in some cases I do the rehabilitation, but in some clinics that I work, I do only the surgery. And then the other colleagues that are specialists in, in rehabilitation, uh, or even in oral surgery, but I do like the, the most uh, demanding cases and then they, they do the rehabilitation mm -hmm. and they do the, the easy cases. Mm -hmm. It's a very good tool for us to communicate because they ring me and say, Raquel, uh, I have ISQ this number and at the beginning it was that number. Do you think it's the ideal time for me to advance with the rehabilitation? If we don't have this value, it's something looking at the x-ray. The x-ray looks sometimes the same or even uh, 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 better when you place the implant than after. It's, it's sometimes it's almost impossible to see if the implant is integrated or not. Of course, if you have like a very um, inflammatory disease that will uh, 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 destroy all the bone, of course, you will see it in the x-ray. But that case is you don't need to see the x-ray because the implant is moving. Yeah. You go with the finger and then you remove the implant. <laughs> In that case is that uh, you can see like a beautiful x-ray 
perfect x-ray. Oh, it looks like the book x-ray. And then yeah. the implant is not stable and comes when you are trying to, to remove the cover screw. Yeah. This is an example. That's why we have subjective ways of seeing the stability and objective ways. Mm -hmm. X-ray is still a subjective way. Sometimes yeah. it can be objective when it's the worst case scenario, but that we don't need the X-ray for. We have the clinical assessment. Um, in the cases that uh, uh, we need to to see if the implant is good or not, if we should explant or regenerate, if it's the the adequate time to do the the, the rehabilitation, the ISQ is the only way to to do it. You know, in an objective and uh, a predictable way. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, all these insights and your experience, that's really valuable um, to, to hear you explain. And uh, I'm happy to hear that the color coding uh, of the new Austin yeah, instrument. I call it the traffic light. The traffic I think light. it's so easy. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's something Even that... To my, my students, it's very easy to explain. Yeah. You are explaining to students that never did implants, don't know what it is ISQ. They have an apparatus that have the the colors of the traffic lights. Yep. It's so they know red. I shouldn't do nothing. Yellow, maybe I can do immediate. Green, I can do immediate loading. This yep. is so easy to pass this message because they associate the color as a, an action. So it's it's really I think it was a, a brilliant idea. Thank you, and, and and that's actually something that generates uh, a lot of comments and positive feedback. Um, I'm I'm uh, intrigued to hear that you're uh, you seem to be communicating around uh, the Austell instrument and the the ISQ values with the patients. Do you explain yeah. also to the patients what it means and already yeah. when you place the implants or even before um, yeah. before the procedure uh, that you do you use this and you will assess their implants with with uh, Austell? Yes, I do because. Um, I think many uh, colleagues guarantee to the patient something that sometimes they, they can't do it or they can't fulfill. Because many uh, uh, colleagues are saying to the patients in um, before that they are going to do immediate holding. I never said that to a patient. I always say, I will try. Mm -hmm. Probably 90% of the situation I will have the conditions but only intraoperatory i'm going to make the decision and what is the 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 things that are going to give me the decision the session torque and i ask you and i explain i have an apparatus this apparatus measures the vibration of the implant the other one the rotation of the stability people understand this it's very easy to understand mm -hmm. so they are complementary and after having these two values together, I will have the decision, should I do immediate loading? Should I put the healing or should I put the cover screw? And I tell the patient, if I will not do the immediate loading, it's not because I don't want, it's because it's not uh, uh, um, adequate to your situation and I'm going to put in risk my work and your health. So people understand this perfectly. Mm -hmm. So I always explain, I do, when I do my um, provision of uh, uh, how, uh, how much it will cost, I, I do the provision of all the situations, always. And then the patient says, oh, but now the clinic, they guarantee me that I, they are going to do immediate loading. And again, I, can, I, tell, I tell them, okay, maybe, I can guarantee you 98 or 99 percent, but I can't guarantee you 100 percent because I don't know what will be the stability of the implants in the day of the surgery. Mm -hmm. Because I can, I can study everything. I can have all the CBCTs, all the the the, the um, programs that measure the, the the bone density before I go to surgery. I can study all the protocols. I can do all the preparation. I can do all the technical things, and at the end, I don't have the right conditions to do the loading. Mm -hmm. So that's why I have to explain this before to the patient. And the patient understands this is something that I, I'm being very careful about them and about my my name as a, an implantologist. Uh, because if I say I will do it for sure, and at that time I don't have the conditions, uh, they say probably she's not very good because she didn't anticipate that probably something could go wrong. So if you if you are uh, tell before you are a genius. If you tell after, you are uh, giving an, an excuse. 
Yeah. So uh, that's why I always, um, and I can tell you 99% of the times I can predict if I will manage to do immediate loading or not. Even if I have to change one implant for a larger platform or whatever, you know, to guarantee the ideal conditions. Because we are talking about patients, we are talking about people and uh, it's our name. Uh, so we need to do everything possible to give the expectations, but sometimes it's not possible. And people have to understand if the cases are very, uh, uh, complex and very in the limit that are the cases that are referees uh, because no one will refer a case that is easy, mm. right? Because yeah. normally the easy case everyone does. Of course. Uh, so normally the, the cases that I have are referrals. So I, I, I try to maintain the, the, the expectations uh, realistic, okay? And I try to explain the patient if I have the right conditions, I will do it, but if I don't, I will protect him and me. So the, the patient will understand. And I normally say, I measure that uh, the ISQ, I measure in the torque, and we have the conditions to do it, mm -hmm. or we don't have it. It's preferable to do like this because it's more safe. And people will understand that because uh, it, we are not machines. We are not, uh, and this medicine is not mathematics. It's, mm -hmm. it's something that is not uh, like, white or black sometimes it's gray and we have to adapt <laughs> yeah yeah um we uh, at Oster we we see the same trend so there's more and more patient involvement and and through the via the clinicians of course one thing that we're uh, working on and i know that you've been um having some initial experience is a cloud service that we call Oster connect have you, have you been able to uh, to yeah try it yet and and if so uh, what's your impression and and uh, uh, so far yeah because um, we are going we are going digital mm -hmm. uh, now and in the future but really now because uh, it's not in the future it's in the present and uh, if we have tools that can be uh, wireless user-friendly, it can be connected to the computer by Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, whatever, uh, that can organize the, 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 the charts uh, um, in an online system, it's much easier to work. And then when you do research, it's even easier because you only have to export a file and you have all the data organized with all the conditions that you have to, to pre-fill in the in the in the in the hostel connect like if the patient is a smoker or if he has diabetes or whatever and then to export in an excel to do a, a statistic uh, um, evaluation of, of the, the the situation it's very easy uh, and the ones that do, does research know this that sometimes it's more difficult to get mm -hmm. the data Yep. in an Excel uh, spreadsheet, uh, then probably doing the rest because you have to go to the traditional uh, paper chart and uh, sometimes you don't understand the numbers and then the assistant uh, writes it in a different color and with a different letter and, you know, and if you have everything systemized uh, in, the, in the online platform, wireless, uh, you can uh, have access everywhere that you, you, you want. Uh, you are in a, a conference, you need the information of that patient, or if, if you have installed in your computers, in your laptops, the, the program is very easy to consult the, the, the informations. So I think the future, the present is going like everything uh, online, everything like wireless, everything user-friendly, everything quick, because uh, everyone wants to do everything quicker and predictable and safer. And uh, this is the trend, uh, the same as uh, online consultations. Mm -hmm. uh, I, when I was in lockdown, I have three different specialties consultations at home, mm -hmm. you know, on the computer. Mm -hmm. I didn't think this will be possible, I don't know, a few months ago, I never thought about it. Right. So we have to adapt, the same as the regarding education. Uh, uh, I can tell you that I had 15 events uh, for this year and 15 uh, of these events were cancelled. Mm -hmm. uh, I have uh, three or four that were not cancelled yet. Let's mm -hmm. hope 
<laughs> they will not be. Uh, but we don't know because of this pandemic situation. Uh, now we are starting to work. Maybe in one month I will be in lockdown again. Mm -hmm. We don't know. So we have to adapt. And I think uh, uh, programs and connections and platforms and can uh, link people online. Uh, you are in Sweden. I'm in Portugal. We are talking. Yeah. Uh, right yes uh, I'm, I'm doing webinars and being seen in i don't know so many countries so we have to adapt and uh, uh, we have to change a little bit the mentality about even the education because i don't see the education programs presential education going like to the normal uh, uh stage so early i think it will take time because if you think all the planes are blocked some frontiers are closed. It's mm -hmm. a nightmare to travel yeah. nowadays. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now <laughs> the I... last year I traveled so much, and this year basically I, I didn't travel because of this situation. Yeah. So we have to adapt, uh, yeah. and, uh, and I think Hostel is is being very uh, smart, uh, trying to put everything like uh, um, in platforms online uh, because it's it, it's not the future it's the present mm -hmm. and the, the digital uh, and uh, having everything connected i know you also have a connection with the wh motor you can even yeah. import the torque and the isq at the same time to the same mm -hmm. uh, platform uh, so it's it's really the 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 the, the trend for, of of the moment to 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 get everything digital and everything without paper and everything uh, quick and everything simple yep and and uh, we are definitely convinced about that uh, uh, you know ability and and uh, promise of of this technology and uh, Austel Connect is intended to simplify things, not just yeah. make it more yeah. complicated. Because I know as a clinician, you have a lot of things going on uh, around the patient when you do procedures and a lot of software and instruments and machines and technology that should work. But so, so we try to make it more automated and simplified, but also add value because of what you mentioned, uh, these units are, are connected and they gather data which you can uh, uh, use so you have uh, easy access to hundred, hundreds of thousands of uh, okay. measurements and many thousands of different patients. So you can, even if you work alone in your practice and maybe not do so much research, you, you can still do the same and type of internal research in yeah. your clinic, in your patients. <laughs> exactly. Course. So for this type, uh, a specific patient or a specific clinical situation, you can just bring up that uh, data very quickly. So, so and compare uh, with the, because otherwise in a paper chart, mm -hmm. sometimes where is the number and then you lost the number and yep. then whatever the, we don't know what is the paper. It's different. There you have everything in the same uh, situation. You can compare it. It's like a graphic. You can do the follow up. So. It's really, really easy and really um, visually easy and uh, uh, very uh, easy to extract the information uh, of how uh, is going the, the, the health of mm. that of Yeah. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> that brings me to, to uh, and you already touched on it and you and I discussed it uh, uh, before we started this, um, um, this conversation. Um, but what do you think will change now, given the current situ situation around the, the consequences of the corona virus and the pandemic uh, in terms of implant dentistry? What do you think will, will change in I the near future? I think a lot of things will change. Mm -hmm. First, uh, I think the philosophy will be uh, to protect more ourselves, our team, our mm -hmm. patients. So consequently, uh, um, almost all the clinic will, will pass to see less patients a day because we need to, you know, to feel and uh, um, do a lot of procedures to have everyone in safety. Mm -hmm. So this for me is not something that will um, shake a little bit uh, the philosophy because in my clinic, you, we already have this kind of philosophy, not seeing too many patients a day. Uh, doing more procedures per patient. Um, it's uh, the kind of um, uh, 
way of treating the, the patients that you already choose for many years. Of course, there's some little things that I have to adapt and the times between consultation have to be bigger and we have to clean everything more uh, and profoundly. Um, and we have to work with all these uh, instruments, all these masks and respirators and, and this, I can tell you, it's very difficult. When we are working several hours in the same patient is a nightmare. Sometimes you don't breathe, you feel dizzy. Mm -hmm. Because you have the monoxide of carbon, you know, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's really, and the, the hot, because we are trying to avoid to, to have air conditioner, and uh, many times the room is very hot with all this equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why in the, in the hospitals, when you do surgeries, normally it's very cold because you use all that stuff. But in, in a normal office, we have to adapt and without uh, the, the air conditioner or at least minimizing the use of air conditioner to avoid the circulation or yep. eventually the virus, uh, sometimes it's a nightmare to work, mm -hmm. not only for us, to the, to the, to the, to the systems also, uh, but we have to protect and we have to adapt. Also, I think uh, people will be more aware of um, the importance of uh, safety. Uh, because many clinics were doing the things not properly. And now uh, I think the concept will be to have, because they are not protecting only the, the patients, they are protecting themselves. Mm -hmm. They should be doing this for a long time, but uh, some clinics were you know, doing so much consultation that were not very careful with these procedures. Maybe it will be a way of people being aware of the risks and uh, uh, that we are putting uh, um, the health uh, of us, of our family, of our friends, of our patients, of our community in risk. Um, and also, as I told before, I think uh, everything is tending to be uh, online, on the phone, uh, not presentially, at least the, the basic things, like many times the patients came to the office to book an appointment. Mm -hmm. Now they only do it for by phone or by email. Uh, so we are changing a little bit our mentality to communicate. Uh, and as you probably know, Portugal is a um, very... Uh, 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 warm uh, climate, people are uh, very friendly, they'd like to hug, they like to kiss. And for us, as a Latin culture, it's very difficult to have the patient entering the the, 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 the consult mm -hmm. and not, you know, not giving <laughs> not. So this is very strange. We have to adapt to the new circumstances. Even the patient, sometimes we, we go and they, oh, yeah. we can. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah, a lot of things are changing. Uh, now we, we communicate more by WhatsApp, by phone, by even by video conference, mm -hmm. uh, online. Uh, we have to, you know, improvise to, to avoid uh, the contacts and then the patient can't uh, be at the living room waiting at the same time. So we have a lot of uh, little things that are completely changing our way mm -hmm. of working. Yeah. And uh, it's we we already had a lonely profession. Now we are feeling more of that because uh, that interaction that we had with the patient, with the with the team, uh, everyone is feeling a little bit, you know, restrained because of all this situation. But uh, I think, of course, things will will get back to normal. Uh, but it will not be like uh, in one or two months. It will take some time for people. And till we have a vaccine or a treatment, I don't think it will be completely normal, to be honest, uh, because people are afraid even to come, even to, you know, uh, to touch and things. You see that people are afraid. And we are trying to minimize that, mm -hmm. uh, helping people by phone, by email, by video conference, um, helping colleagues also in education by webinars, by education platforms, because at this moment, uh, someone asked me, can I go to your clinic to see you work? No, because I, I don't even let the, the patient bring someone with him. Mm -hmm. What is the logic of putting one more member, you know, assisting to the surgeries? So at this moment, it's very difficult to do presential education, clinical residencies, or even conferences. We have thousands of people together, yeah. doctors. If we have one or two that have the disease, 
probably they will contaminate, I don't know, yeah. dozens. And then they go to their houses and they mm -hmm. contaminate their families and then mm -hmm. the, 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 the patients. And this is like a situation that is difficult to control. That's why we need to restructure really the everything with the patients, with the colleagues, with the education, um, and adapt for now. Uh, maybe if we'll find a vaccine or uh, a cure, maybe it will go back more to normal and we can be presential and hug and kiss. And But for now, it's uh, at least for us that we are very warm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, people, uh, it's it's difficult. I know yeah. in Sweden the, the mentality is a little bit different. Uh, in the Nordic countries, normally people are more like they 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 are nice, but they are more distant in terms of physical contact. Yeah. But uh, Portugal, Spain, uh, Brazil, you know, people like to <laughs> touch yeah. and to, to kiss and to hug. So it's even more difficult to to do it. For me, yeah. in two two months at home, it was really uh, uh something Tough. that i mm -hmm. wouldn't expect in a million years you yeah. know uh i'm not used to be at home uh so but it was also good because you 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 learn how to uh give value to other things that probably you were not so aware yeah uh, like the family like uh, uh helping with school with your kids and because now they have homeschool so mm -hmm. you need to be there like from nine to to five it's a new job you're now a teacher yeah. uh so uh, some things were good of course other things were less good because we are isolated we can't uh, be with our friends at least presently but we are redefining uh, the parties with the uh, video yeah. <laughs> conferences, and um, my, my I can tell you that my my daughter and me uh, had birthday during lockdown, so we had a Zoom meeting with all the the friends, and we did the, the happy birthday all together by video conference. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> We have to adapt. <laughs> yeah, you have to uh, become uh, creative. So uh, you know, it's. Uh, but I think you're you're right. And in, uh, in you know that dentistry can be a rather lonely uh, profession sometimes. Yeah. So and yeah. that's that's also why we're at Ostel trying to you know create content and stay in touch with you know our uh, clinicians and our partners like yourself. And, and also share as much information and, and uh, knowledge as, as we can. So, uh, and that's why we do these small little interviews sometimes in, in, our, in the form of articles. This time we do uh, uh, like a video recording that we can share with your colleagues around the world. So one question that we uh, always ask and that we're also quite interested in is inspiration. What's, what has inspired you in your career so far and, and you know, looking forward. Okay, I'm going to start. I have to give the credit to my mom and dad first, mm -hmm. uh, because they uh, taught me that uh, even being a woman, I can be successful in my career. And uh, they, they at, at my home, uh, the, the roles are a little bit inverted. My mom was uh, a nurse. Uh, she had a, a career, she was more outside home, and my dad had a good job, but had like more uh, traditional job from nine to five. So he was more at home cooking and uh, uh, giving me uh, support and uh, taking me to activities. So for me, it was not uh, something uh, um, extraordinary, you know, to, to, to try to fight for a, a career um because we are still thinking that is equal but is still not the the, the same opportunities unfortunately it's changing uh, at least it's changing but uh, i hope in my daughter generation it will be equal but it's still not equal so my mom and dad are like my big supporters and then of course i have a lot of um 
uh, I call it friends because they are my friends too, and professionals that I admire. And uh, I, they inspire me every day because they motivate me, they, they incentivate me to be better, to, to go forward. And I can tell you some names like Delia Tottel or Snejana Paul or Marvari Kashwari that are ladies, also very strong ladies, and that they, they support me a lot in, in starting my international career as a, as a speaker and as a teacher. Uh, also, I have role models here in Portugal, like Miguel Stanley or Dr. João Pimenta, that is from an older generation, that were uh, one of the first people that noticed me and uh, saw that I had potential and uh, wanted to invest me uh, to give education. And some brands didn't see it at that time because I was very young. I was finishing my master's degree. I was like 26 or 27 and I look even younger. So, you know, this kind of uh, um, kind of uh, uh, sexism, uh, I have to say, uh, at the beginning was a little bit difficult. Now I don't feel that anymore because I, I think I already made uh, the steps to, to get there and fight it a lot to get where I am to, uh, today. But it took time and uh, uh, the opportunities are not so easy to catch. And, uh, but uh, yeah, if you, if you work hard, you will manage, but you have to work probably two or three times harder than uh, mainly work CV. That I can, I can guarantee yeah. you. And then uh, I can show you, can I show you a, here a slide? Because I sometimes put this in my presentation. So, in 2001, I was a student and uh, I, I saw the Team Atlanta mm -hmm. with Dr. Barber uh, uh, lecturing in Portugal. And I was so mesmerized with that. I was so, you know, I was a terrific presentation. And I, I, I made a wish that someday I will be on a, on a stage with that uh, role model to me. And that happened like uh, 16 years after uh, in New York University. Uh, so Dr. Salama uh, uh, invited me to be a keynote speaker at the Dental XP Event Summit uh, in, in New York University. That is the university, you know, like UPenn is the university. And uh, I was the, the only speaker, uh, woman, the only woman speaker. We were like, I think, 14. Uh, you can see there's Nejana, but she was there assisting. She also is a speaker at Dental XP, but not at this one. And uh, Tony Salama, that is the next generation of the Salama, that is a girl. So uh, this is really uh, something that uh, inspired me and um, uh, it was, uh, I don't know, something like uh, a fool. I don't know how to, to, to tell you, uh, but uh, at that time um, it was something different. You know, I saw mm -hmm. something there that I aimed to go. You know, of course, at that time I was a student, I was, I don't know, 23 or 24. Um, for me, that was unreachable, you know, but something inside me told me, okay, I liked it so much. I want to be, you know, a teacher. I want to go on stage and one day I will manage to be on stage with these guys. And, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yeah, it, 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 uh, it uh, went through. Uh, many years after after yeah. a lot of study a lot of uh, effort um and i can tell you also one uh, curious thing in 2002 when i graduated i wanted to go to the united states to do my post graduation and i wanted to go or to new york university or to upenn because it was the most high you know uh stand status mm -hmm. in the dentistry and the implantology field and restorative field and uh, then uh, when I saw the prices, it co was completely not possible for me uh, in Portugal. Uh, the salaries are not like the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, so I couldn't afford it. Not me, not my parents, uh, of course. And um, that's why I decided to go to Sweden because it was near and the prices was uh, much uh, less. 
And what is funny is uh, 15 years after I was invited to be a lecturer at New York University, and 17 years after I was invited to be lecturer at UPenn. Yeah. So I didn't manage to go as a student because I couldn't afford even to apply. But then I, I managed to go as a lecturer uh, by, by the big door, I can yeah. say. So it was really, uh, for me, like the best moments of my career. Um, I have probably more important things, but the ones that really touched me was to lecture at NYU and lecture at UPenn. Yeah. Because it's like a dream come true, uh, you know, like I, I, I couldn't do it the, the traditional way, but I managed to get there uh, in a different way, mm-hmm. uh, more precious, I think. So uh, it was really, um, and, and what is funny is <laughs> uh, Dr. Salama invited me to, to go to New York University as a speaker, mm-hmm. and uh, he graduated from UPenn. Is his alma mater, UPenn, yeah. and who invited me to to go to UPenn is from restorative, not even from surgery. It's Dr. Mark Lutz that I I really appreciate his work. is a fantastic, uh, not only professional but human being. Um, and uh, for me, it was two of my highlights in my in my career. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, I think it was a prize of the big effort that I made. Uh, you know, to study all these years and having kids and studying at the same time and having divorce and studying at the same time and having clinics and separate the clinics is not easy, you know, to, to balance everything and being a woman and a mother even more. Uh, but uh, what I, I would like to transmit to the new generation of uh, women dentists that are in this time uh, more than, than men, actually, uh, that is possible. Uh, it takes time. It, it's still not the same opportunity, but we are trying to to change that and give um, the same balance uh, to both genders. Uh, but uh, because many years ago it was a male-dominated uh, profession, it was basically only ma- male uh, professionals, uh, people are taking a little bit time to process <laughs> yeah. the, the change. But... Uh, in the present and the future will be a female profession. Yeah. I'm sure of that. At least in Portugal, 80% of the students now in, in university are women. So we need to change the paradigm and give more opportunities to women because otherwise, in 10 years, we'll not have any educator. <laughs> no, no, that's that's <laughs> true. It's, it's uh, changing. We see that in, in many markets. Uh, so um... Probably in Sweden the same. And yeah. At least in Europe is a big tendency. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The of women in the, in the profession. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for for those important thoughts and all the information you've shared with us uh, today. Um, we're really looking forward to our continued collaboration and, and uh, knowledge mm-hmm. sharing. And um, hopefully, hopefully, uh, we keep our fingers crossed here. Uh, the EAO in Berlin uh, will take place, you know, in one way or the other uh, later this year. So, um, and and we're. Looking forward to working together with you there as well. Um, yeah, and I'm very honored for the invitation mm-hmm. and to collaborate at AO. Let's let's hope it will be presential, but uh, if not, something will happen or online or maybe exactly a little further in in time. Yeah, uh, I, I feel very honored with the invitation, and uh, I'm very glad to. Uh, share the stage with some big names uh, of the implant dentistry and uh, and to to collaborate with Ostel because it's uh, a brand that I really respect and I think it's a brand that is doing a lot of things to help the, the dentists in a daily basis. So thank you for the opportunity also. Thank you, um, Raquel. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. And see you, I hope, soon. Yes. <laughs>